Heavenly Father, that is our prayer, that we want you to speak through your word and speak clearly and to speak authoritatively, speak powerfully over us till we as a church family are built up and that we reflect your son. We are more and more in the image of him, that we grow into the stature of the fullness that is his that would be glorifying to you. That's what this world needs to see is not just a Christian living a life of obedience, but a church family, a body living in alignment with your word that you might be glorified and they would see that there is a family to belong to where forgiveness of sin is possible. We thank you for your son. It's in his great name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. And let's take our... Bibles this morning and open them up one more time to Romans chapter 1. We've come to the end of a major section of Romans chapter 1, and my hope at the end of these major sections of the letter is, my hope is to do something of of a summary sermon on them, on that section, and why do this? Well, Romans is, is a really long letter, um... It's a long letter with a very long gospel argument being made all the way through it. And it is so deep theologically, therefore for many it it becomes an intimidating letter. I I don't understand Romans. Romans is just, that's that's a tough letter. So if we can summarize Romans along the way and try to tie each section back to the summary of what the purpose of the letter is for... I think we have a better chance of grasping Paul's gospel argument in it along the way. Another reason for doing something of a summary like this is that sometimes your view of a section before you study it gets expanded as you've gone through it, right? And there may be a need to do some refining or clarifying together at the end of a section. And one last reason is there are some things in each Sunday's preaching that just don't get said that... Maybe the preacher wishes he could say. And um, so there might be some pastoral kind of reflections or burdens or an encouragement that would be fitting for our church family to think about at the end of a section. And there's one of those today that I want to share with you. So I'm going to give you three basic points today as kind of a review. One, we're just going to look at Romans as a whole. And then secondly, we'll look at what Romans 1 was about. And then I'll have maybe a pastoral encouragement for you. So let's just dig in. Number one, Romans as a whole. Let's try to refresh our memories a little bit. Let's start with the bigger picture first. Remember, Romans is a missionary support letter. But it's one unlike you've ever read from any present-day missionary because God's intent with this letter is that it would be authoritative revelation of himself in his scriptures. This is a God-breathed missionary support letter. This is the Apostle Paul's missionary support letter to the church in Rome. He wrote it in AD 56. Paul was there finishing up his third missionary journey, and while he was in Corinth, um, he was aiming for Spain. He was aiming to the west of Rome and Italy. And Paul desires to take the gospel to Spain, He's, um, and he sees the church in Rome as a crucial partner to help him take the gospel further than he's ever taken the gospel before in the Mediterranean. What did he write to endear them to his gospel mission? Well, that's this letter. That's this letter. Uh, Turn over to Romans chapter 15 for a moment. You can see this. This is his intent. Romans 15, verse 23. As we think about the big picture of what the purpose of this letter was, Paul says, but now, with no further place for me in these regions, meaning he's satisfied to the extent of which he has taken the gospel across the Mediterranean, with no further place for me in these regions, and since I have had for many years a longing to come to you whenever I go to Spain... For I hope to see you in passing and to be helped on my way there by you when I have first enjoyed your company for a while. Look at verse 28. Last sentence. I will go on by way of you to Spain. 
So that's Paul's desire to partner with the church in Rome. But this church in Rome had, at this point, no direct influence or guidance from an apostle. It wasn't planted by one of the apostles. It had no direct influence from any one of the apostles throughout its existence up until the time Paul writes. And so Paul, uh, before he partners with them in taking the gospel to Spain, he first wants to make sure that the church in Rome is well established in the gospel that he preaches. And so that's why he's writing. He's going to do that with his letter, hoping to establish them. And he'll do that with them when he spends a little bit of time with them. And what will establish them is what will endear them to his partner, uh, to partner with him, and that is, it is the gospel. Let's look back at Romans chapter 1 and see this idea of establishing. In fact, if you kind of keep the back end of Romans and the front end of Romans together, I don't know how you do that in an, an electronic device. I do it like this in my Bible with paper. But if you could kind of do that in your mind, if you look at Romans chapter 1, verse 11... Paul says, for I long to see you so that I may impart some special gift to you that you may be established. That is, that I may be encouraged together with you while among you, each of us by the other's faith, both yours and mine. So he wants to use his spiritual gift of apostleship to establish them. And then worked in with that is them being able to see each other's faith in Jesus. And he says... Verse 13, I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that often I plan to come to you and have been prevented so far so that I may obtain some fruit among you also, even as among the rest of the Gentiles. I am under obligation both um, to uh, Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. So for my part, I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. He wants to establish them. He's eager to preach the gospel to them. If you go to the last chapter of Romans, chapter 16, verse 25, as he closes the letter, he says this in kind of a benediction. He says, now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ. So the bookends on Romans are about being established in the gospel. So um, everything between is the gospel in all of its richness, in all of its beauty, in all of its depth, and in all of its power. And Paul's belief is that in establishing them in the gospel that he preaches, that they will be endeared to the gospel mission and endeared to that gospel itself. But they'll be endeared in such a way that they will want the gospel to be preached in places it has not yet gone yet. You see, this is an important thing to understand. Being established in the gospel inevitably makes you want more and more people to know the gospel, to believe the gospel. Being established in the gospel makes you want to see it expand. And so our summary statement of the letter reflects this very purpose for Paul's writing. I'll put it up on the screen for you here. The gospel will establish us, then endear us to the expansion of the gospel. That's the purpose of Paul's letter. Here are the key words. Establish, endear, expand. That was Paul's intent with the letter in AD 56 with the church in Rome. And God, but by desiring this letter to occupy something of a really central point in his scriptures, he intends that original purpose of the letter to have an enduring effect on the church throughout the centuries. Its original purpose must have an impact on us even as we study it 2,000 years later. These key words in regards to the gospel need to overtake us in 2017 establish. I want to be established in the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. Endear. I want all that I am endeared to the gospel of Jesus Christ in greater ways. Expand. I want, I want to be endeared in such a way that I want the gospel of Jesus Christ to go. Um, I don't want to be the only one amazed by it. I want it to go to countless others who will become amazed at it also through faith in Jesus. 
So now that we've re- reviewed the summary of the letter, let's consider, secondly, number two this morning, Romans 1 specifically. And we'll, we'll talk about it in this way, where we've been and where we're headed. The first 15 verses of chapter 1 introduce us to the Apostle Paul. If you go back to chapter 1 and just kind of look at uh, verses 1 through 15, you can see it there. Um, and we broke down this section this way. We, we called it Romans 1, 1 to 15, the Apostle of gospel righteousness. Now, there's a handout for you at the information table if you want it. Um, it's just a, it includes the summary statement of the purpose of Romans, and then it has this outline and this kind of breakdown of um, Romans, section by section. And we called that first 15 verses there the apostle of gospel righteousness. Now, we'll talk in a moment why I have a phrase like gospel righteousness or something similar to it on every one of these titles. But the first seven verses, um, that is Paul's official introduction of himself as an apostle. Remember, he's never been to Rome. He's never been to this church. He knows some of the church there. Their names are listed in chapter 16 that he knows. But he has not been there yet, and he doesn't want to skip over an official introduction of himself as an apostle of Jesus Christ. Romans 1, 1 to 7 is something official that Paul could say about himself to anybody, anywhere that he wanted to go. But if you look at verses 8 through 15, now this section is Paul's personal introduction of himself as an apostle. The difference between 1 to 7 and 8 to 15 is seen in how many times Paul has these I statements in verses 8 to 15. In verses 1 to 7, he doesn't say I once, but in verses 8 to 15, or if you count 8 to 16, he has 16, or I'm sorry, 13 I statements. That's very personal. He wants to reveal himself. He wants to reveal his desires regarding them. He wants to reveal his goal and how it involves them. He wants to reveal his convictions so that they will be inclined to keep reading more that he has to say. And so then upon fully introducing himself, and this is Paul's longest introduction in any of his letters, he then lays out, he just goes for the jugular. He just says, this is what this letter is about. And that takes us to the second section, Romans 1, 16 to 17, the revelation of gospel righteousness. Let's look at it. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous by faith shall live. Upon mentioning the gospel, Paul makes a beeline for the righteousness of God, for the righteousness of God. The gospel reveals that righteousness of God in some way in connection with faith. And I encourage you to go back and and listen to that sermon if you missed it. Uh, We can't take the time to unpack everything and what that means again. But what Paul means by this revealing the righteousness of God is that whenever a sinner believes the gospel, and it doesn't matter who they are, if they're a Jew or a Greek, by that faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ, God's righteousness is revealed. This righteousness of God is revealed. God's righteousness that he gives to the believing one on the basis of their faith alone. He declares that sinner now to be righteous with his righteousness on the basis of that sinner's faith alone in Jesus Christ. And this is the great theme of the letter of Romans. This is what he wants to establish them in. This is what he hopes will endear them to the gospel mission expanding. This is justification by faith alone. This is a missionary support letter. In Paul's day, the Jews, for the most part, had grossly missed this believing and being declared righteous with God's righteousness on the basis of faith alone. And instead, what they were impressed with, for the most part, was trying to reveal their own self-righteousness, their own works righteousness, through their obedience to God's law. That was salvation in their minds, in their eyes. And they exported that false salvation everywhere that they had been dispersed to across the Roman world. Their synagogues in the cities, in the Gentile cities, 
became something like works righteousness factories and export sites, so to speak. Paul came up against this on every single one of his missionary journeys to every single city that had a synagogue. The Jews in the synagogues loved their own version of righteousness that they thought they achieved through their obedience. They loved that more than God's righteousness revealed in the gospel through faith and faith alone in Jesus. So Paul says the gospel reveals the righteousness of God on the basis of one's faith and faith alone. There's no works involved at all. The preaching of that gospel reveals the righteousness when sinners believe the gospel. And that in Paul's day was also then a recovery of the righteousness of God from the Jews' self-righteous attempts with God's law. You see, one of the profound things that was going on in the first century through the preaching of the gospel by the Apostle Paul is God is recovering his own righteousness that he gives on the basis of faith alone. He's recovering it from the refuse pile of the Jews' works righteousness. The synagogues of the Jews won't be revealing God's righteousness. Think on that. They are the privileged people of God. Paul's going to talk about that. And what he is establishing in the first century is that the synagogues of the Jews won't be revealing God's righteousness as long as they stay with works righteousness. Instead, a new family is being formed. A new body is being formed by those who believe Christ. It's called the church. Instead, in the first century, it is the churches of Jesus Christ that will be revealing God's righteousness in the preaching of the gospel when that gospel is believed, whether by it's a Jew or a, a, a Gentile. From one man's faith in Jesus to the next woman's faith in the gospel to that Greek man's faith in the gospel to that Jewish woman's faith in Jesus God's righteousness is recovered and revealed. And this is why in every section title that I've given to you, I've included either gospel righteousness as a tag on the end of it or something related to it because this is Paul's burden. And this is his motivation and missions. This is why he does what he does. He wants the righteousness of God to be revealed and to be recovered. There's no other righteousness to be concerned with except this righteousness that's connected to the gospel, that's revealed in the gospel because it is God's righteousness. The rest of what Paul writes after verse 17 in chapter 1 flows from this. It, it's written to make this case. So where does Paul go next? To the next section, Romans 1, 18 to 32, the Gentiles of unrighteousness, and this is what we spent two Sundays on recently. Paul tells us the reason the gospel reveals the righteousness of God on the basis of faith in the gospel. It's because everywhere across the planet, all the time, presently, God is wrathful toward unrighteous man. Verse 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. What a contrast. There's unrighteousness, and in that unrighteousness, we suppress the truth that reveals God's righteousness. Unrighteous man is broadcasting his filthy, ungodly unrighteousness everywhere all the time. And Paul tells us God is presently active in wrath against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth. So God's wrath is revealed in verse 18. And the wrath is deserved, verses 19 to 23. If you look down there with me, man deserves the wrath of God because of these inexcusable evidences. Um, verse 19, that which is known about God is evident within them because God made it evident to them. When God makes something evident, it's clear. And because, verse 21, um, I'm sorry, verse 20, um, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen. We know it. It's being understood through what has been made. These are inexcusable evidences against those who suppress the truth. And man deserves the present wrath of God because of indefensible offenses against him in verses 21 to 23. I mean, look at the heights of which man has fallen. Look at this. Um, 
Even though we know God, even though we know God, we don't honor him as God. We don't give thanks. We became futile in our speculations or in our reasoning powers, and our foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, we became fools, and we exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image, like a scribbling of incorruptible things, of man, of birds, of four-footed animals, and even reptiles on the ground. I mean, what a fall that man has taken. Man deserves the present wrath of God because of this. So in what sense, then, is the present deserved wrath of God being revealed? Well, that's what verses 24 to 32 were all about. Those verses tell us just how God is inflicting wrath on men who deserve it. He says three times, God gave them over, verse 24. Verse 26, God gave them over. And verse 28, God gave them over. God actively takes criminal man, guilty man, convicted man in his courtroom, and he puts his judicial holy hand on his back, and he pushes him out of God's courtroom, and God pushes him down into the prison of his wrath. God imprisoned man, imprisons man then into his own sexual immorality or sexual impurity in verses 24 and 25, which results in degraded bodies. Man is imprisoned in his sin that he loves instead of God, and he's held there under the wrath of God until the day of judgment. It's terrifying. God was active in this, putting us there. And what Paul means more specifically by that dishonoring of their bodies is stated in verse 26 and 27. We saw this last week, that God judicially imprisons man into his own degrading passions. And what he's referring to there in verses 26 and 27 is homosexual activity. That is the dishonoring of the bodies that women and men do together when they are given over judicially by God to sexual impurity or degrading passions. And then in verses 28 to 32, finally, God imprisons man into his depraved mind. Man's mind is so broken and so deceived and so ruined it's ruined. I mean, the evidence is everywhere. We suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Um, we know God. We don't honor him as God. We have futile speculations. We exchange the truth of God for a lie. Man is imprisoned by God into a mind. Listen carefully. God gave us over into a mind that will never be able to reason its way out of God's wrath. That mind generates a host of behaviors in the prison of God's wrath that are hideous, and that's verses uh, 29 down to through 31. So Paul's point in this whole section here is that whenever you see sexual impurity or when you see the degrading passion of homosexuality, you are pre seeing presently the wrath of God inflicted. God gave them over to it judicially like a judge gives a condemned criminal over to the prison. And when you see man filled with, verse 29, unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, when you see man full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice, when you see gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent men, arrogant women, boastful kids, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, when you see man who is untrustworthy, unloving, and unmerciful, you are seeing presently, right now, the wrath of God being inflicted on man. God gave them over. God gave us over. God gave you over. Our unrighteousness is on full display every minute of every day with every breath that we breathe. And justly so, God puts his wrath on display every minute of every day with every breath that we breathe. 
That's the point of Romans 1. But God is also revealing more than that. More than that. He reveals his righteousness wherever and whenever an unrighteous, condemned rebel in his prison of wrath believes the gospel. This righteousness God revealed is not the criminal's righteousness. God doesn't come to the prison bar of your life and say, hey, and and toss through the bars some of his rules and say, "Um, try some of these rules of mine. Let's see if you can generate some righteousness with these. I mean, Romans 132 clarifies what we've already done in regards to God's rules. Look at verse 32. And although they know the ordinance of God or the commandment of God, we know that these things that he listed, we know that they are worthy of punishment, that those who practice such things are worthy of death. We know that. But we not only keep doing them, we give full approval to the other inmates with us when they do them. God doesn't come to the prison bar and say, here, try this, and let's see what you can do with it. The righteousness that God brings to the imprisoned sinner is his own. And when the criminal ceases in his prison cell from any good works, I speak as if insane, as if we can't do anything good in that prison cell, And when he instead believes Jesus Christ, God declares the unrighteous rebel to be righteous in God's sight on the basis of that faith alone. And the door swings wide open. The God of wrath sees his own declared righteousness in the cell, and the door is open. That is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Just maybe a couple questions for you to think about. Whose righteousness is being revealed through your life today? It is either your own unrighteousness that you are filled with, verse 29, being filled with, with all unrighteousness, or it is God's righteousness that he has declared over you because of your faith in Jesus Christ in the gospel to save you. It's one or the other, and that's it. Which righteousness is being revealed through your life today? Maybe we can get to the heart of this with another question. What is God revealing in your life today? It's one of two things. It is either his deserved wrath or it is his own righteousness. And what a contrast. He's either revealing in your life right now wrath or he's revealing his righteousness. He has either given you over to be imprisoned in your sin and to be imprisoned under his wrath or he is revealing his righteousness in your life because of your faith in Jesus alone. It's one or the other. And and this is where we've been. The chapter starts off with the apostle of gospel righteousness. All he wants in this world is to preach the gospel so that God's righteousness in the gospel can be revealed in the faith of those who believe. That's the revelation of gospel righteousness in verses 16 to 17. And then Paul just drops us off the edge of the cliff of God's wrath into the Gentiles of unrighteousness, verses 18 to 32. We see there how hopeless unrighteous man is in the prison of God's wrath if man looks to himself for help. What's next? There are some who will hear all that bad news about mankind and still not think that Paul is describing them but others. There are some who will hear verse 32 end and think, that's right, those Gentiles are deserving of wrath and judgment. And in Paul's day, the ones he heard that kind of thinking from were his fellow Jews. So Paul is going to address in chapter 2, all the way through chapter 3, verse 20, he's going to address the Jews. 
Now, maybe it's true that the Jews weren't practicing every single horrific sin described by Paul in Romans 1, but that doesn't mean that they were innocent before God or that they were righteous in his sight. You haven't committed all of these sins there. But because they still sin against God, they are in trouble. And what also makes them guilty is that they wanted a righteousness of their own based on their obedience to God's law. And that is a righteousness that God will never, 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 never accept. And he won't accept yours either. And so this next section in chapter 2, 1 through 320 is called the Jews with works righteousness. That's where we're headed next. There's only one righteousness God gives. There's only one righteousness that God accepts. It is the righteousness that we cannot generate while imprisoned in our sin and imprisoned under God's wrath, even if we have his laws in prison, even if we have his Bible in prison, even if we go to church in his prison, God must come to our prison in the preaching of the gospel, and only by faith in Jesus does God declare the sinner righteous in his sight. So maybe a question for you as you anticipate where we're headed next. Have you heard the devastating description of sinners in Romans chapter 1? And have you been thinking of others and not yourself? Have you heard of how wrathful God is right now towards sinners and you've been thinking of others only? Have you exempted yourself from the contents of Romans 1 thinking that, well, you've got some good things going on? Religiously speaking, the truth is that Romans 1 doesn't exempt you. It doesn't exempt me. And Romans 2 to 3 certainly will not exempt you if you're trying to work for God's favor. So where are we headed? Both unrighteous Gentiles and works righteousness Jews are equally condemned before God. Even though the Jews were God's people with privileges. Why? Why? Because the gospel is the only revelation point of God's declared righteousness when a sinner believes and is the only thing that will unlock the door and set us free. All right, so that's Romans 1. Number three this morning, some pastoral encouragement from Romans 1. I want to expand on this a little bit more and think about this a little bit more and give you um, some gospel encouragement this morning. Paul's point in 18 to 32 in chapter 1 that really needs to be grasped by you and me and as a church. The way mankind got into those prison cells was through, no doubt, our rejection of God. But Paul's terrifying point in chapter 1, verses 18 to 32, especially 24 to 32, Paul's terrifying point is how active God is in putting us there by his own holy and judicial hand. He didn't watch us inadvertently stumble into our prisons of sexual immorality and de dishonored bodies and degrading passions and depraved minds. No, God gave us over to those prisons in his wrath. In this world, as you look out on this world, mankind lives with mankind in those prisons, those personal prisons, because mankind deserves it and because God judicially put mankind there. If God is the one who put us there, there's only one person who can get us out. The only way to get out is if a believer in Jesus Christ comes back down the hallway and preaches the good news, the gospel, to those who are imprisoned in their sin and God's wrath. In that preaching of the gospel... God can take his holy and judicial hand and he can extend it through the prison bars to offer faith in his son. You see, there is no saving faith in that prison cell that will be effective. There is no faith that can be generated in that cell by those people on their own. They don't want to. They hate God. How does a hater of God generate faith in God? In the gospel and at the prison bars, God makes it clear that he put his holy and judicial hand on his son instead at the cross, and he delivered him 
over for us. Turn to Romans chapter 8, verse 32. You need to see this. It's the same exact statement he makes in Romans chapter 1 three times. Romans 1, verse 24, God gave them over, us. Verse 26, God gave them over, me. Verse 28, God gave them over, you. Chapter 8, verse 32, he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us. God gave him over, his son, at the cross and crushed him there. God gave him over. How will he not freely give us all things? We're not even there yet for chapter 8. But just notice, there's only one way to get out. The God who gave us over had to give his son over. And he had to come and send somebody to the prison cell and preach that gospel to us. And now, with the same holy and judicial hand, God can, with mercy and with love, reach through the bars and supply faith, the faith needed to believe the gospel and to be saved by its power. When you believe Jesus with that faith that God brings in the gospel, the power of God that is the gospel saves you. And you are freed from God's wrath because Jesus' death in your place. And you are freed because you are righteous with the righteousness that God gives and declares over you on the basis of faith alone. Believer, you may be living with someone every day who is still imprisoned in their sin and imprisoned in God's wrath. Maybe it's a a spouse Maybe it's a son or a daughter. It's a parent. You all work and go to school every day with men and women who are still imprisoned in their sin and imprisoned in God's wrath. So here's my pastoral charge for your question for you. How do you approach them? How do we approach them? What should your demeanor be? As you walk back down that filthy hallway to their prison they live in, what should your attitude be? What should your approach to them look like? That's the question I have for you, and I have four answers for you. How should I approach those still imprisoned in their sin and God's wrath, number one? Approach them with gospel humility. If you are saved by grace through faith alone in the gospel of Jesus Christ, there is only one reason you are free and that they are not. And it has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with Jesus. The only difference between them in their prison and you outside is Jesus. You are free not because you weren't as bad. Your badness was just different than their badness, perhaps. But you were equally deserving of God's wrath. The difference between you and them is Jesus. The difference between you and them is faith in Jesus. For by grace, you have been saved by faith. Not as a result of works, so that no one would boast, right? It is a gift of God, this faith. Therefore, you can't walk up to them in their imprisoned life and act like you're all shocked and offended at what what they're doing. You can't do that. You can't walk up to them like you never were there yourself. You can't walk up to them like you're not capable of what they currently are. That would would be arrogance. That would be forget that you were purified from your former sins, 2 Peter 1. You see, you know what faith is? Saving faith that God gives in the gospel, it is the great leveler. It is the great humbling leveler. You can't boast about anything concerning you on the outside of the prison cell because even the faith that you exercised, he had to give. So that no one should boast. Boast. 
Let's watch Paul express this attitude. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 13. Paul will describe himself in the prison, and then he'll describe himself outside of the prison. 1 Timothy 1, 13. Even though I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor, Yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. See, he was only in unbelief there in the prison. Blaspheming, persecuting Christians, violating, uh, being violent and aggressive against them. Verse 14, and the grace of our Lord was more than abundant. With what? The faith and the love which are found in Christ Jesus. It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance. Here's what he says outside the prison of others. Here's what he says. Listen to this gospel humility. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost of all. He ranks himself as the worst of all. He doesn't look down on them. He's looking up at them. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 9. Look what Paul said there. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9. Or do you not know that the unrighteous, that's all of us in the cell, that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Nobody in that cell will inherit the kingdom of God. Don't be deceived. Fornicators in there don't. Idolaters don't. Nor adulterers nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, no swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God as they are like that. And by the way, notice that Paul lumps a whole bunch of sins on an equal playing field. If you commit heterosexual adultery, you are as guilty as homosexuals who commit their sin. Premarital sex, as unrighteous in God's sight, as same saying, same sex acts. Stealing, drunkenness, all of that. Those inherit the, cannot inherit the kingdom of God. But watch what he says in verse 11. Such were some of you. He's talking to the church. Some of you were just this. But you were sanctified. You were set apart by God. You were justified, declared righteous on the basis of faith alone. You were washed. See what he says? How can you be arrogant? Such were some of you. Such were some of you. When God saves by his grace through faith, that never promotes arrogance. It only produces humility. Express that humility as you talk with those who are still imprisoned in their sin and under God's wrath. Let them hear from you what you're really shocked by. You're not standing before them shocked at what they do. You're standing before them shocked that you're even saved. How should you approach those still imprisoned in their sin and in God's wrath? You approach them with gospel humility. Secondly, approach them with gospel compassion. Gospel humility opens the door for gospel compassion. Listen, if, if you're arrogant toward those who are still imprisoned in their sin and God's wrath, you will never want to draw near to them. You will never want to put your hand on their shoulder. You will never want to shake their hand. You will never want to get to know them. You won't want to know what their name is. You won't want to care for them. You won't want to extend compassion toward them, but... If you are humbled by saving faith in the gospel that was given to you, your heart will overflow with compassion. Go back to Matthew 9. Let's look at our Savior exercising compassion. Matthew chapter 9, verse 36. Matthew 9, 36. Matthew 9, verse 36. Seeing the people, Jesus felt compassion for them. Why? Because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. And then 
his compassion is immediately linked with his gospel mission. He turned to his disciples and said, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. Compassion and the gospel mission go hand in hand. Gospel humility and compassion will continually move you toward evangelism. You will have pity for those whose lives reflect their sin and God's wrath on them. You will want to know their name. You will want to hear the tragic stories of their lives. You will want to speak gently in response to them. You will just want to be near them. How should you approach those still in prison and their sin and God's wrath with gospel humility, with gospel compassion, thirdly, with gospel truth? Listen, a deathly sick man will never seek the life-giving, life-saving treatment available until he truly knows what is wrong with him. And until he truly knows about the medicine that heals and overcomes his sickness, he needs to know the truth. And a sinner still imprisoned in his own sin and God's wrath will never think rightly of God's salvation until he truly knows how unrighteous and how, wrathful, how unrighteous he is and how wrathful God is. He needs to know the truth. And a sinner will, still imprisoned in his own sin and God's wrath will never think rightly about the kind of power that it takes to open the door until he truly knows the gospel, which is the power of God for salvation. He needs to know the truth. A sinner still imprisoned in his own depraved mind and God's wrath will never stop relying on his ruined thinking patterns until it is pointed out to him by the gospel and so that he can turn away in repentance from his ruined thinking by the Spirit's help. A sinner still imprisoned in his own sin and God's wrath will never see how bankrupt his own good works are until he sees how righteous God is until he sees how, what a massive chasm there is between his unrighteousness and God's righteousness. And a sinner still imprisoned in his own sin and in his, under the wrath of God will never be delivered until he sees that God did not spare his own son at the cross for those who believe. And a sinner still imprisoned in his own sin and God's wrath will never be able to understand saving faith until he truly knows it comes only in the gospel. He must know the truth and so forth. The communication of that truth must be done with gospel humility and with gospel compassion. And let's not foolishly put humility and compassion on one side pitted against the hard truths of chapter one. Let's not do that. As if humility and compassion find the hard truth of Roman one, uh, Romans 1 incompatible. Or as if whenever the hard truths of Romans 1 are said, it's automatically just unloving. That's foolish. Our Savior in his ministry to sinners every day married his truth in the gospel with his compassion and humility. And what God has joined together, let no man separate. If Jesus did it, so can we, so must we. So how should I approach those still imprisoned in their sin and in God's wrath with gospel humility, gospel compassion, and gospel truth, and lastly, with gospel hope. Gospel hope. When a sinner imprisoned in his sin and God's wrath begins to grasp how sinful his life truly is and how holy God is, when he begins to grasp how deserved his wrath is against him, when he begins to grasp how enslaved he is to his own sin, that sinner needs to be given hope, but gospel hope. What do I mean? Well, you're living proof of it. You are living proof that their life can indeed change by the power of of the gospel and for the glory of Jesus Christ. The power of God for salvation that the gospel is, is powerful enough to swing open the prison door and set them free into a new life. That's what happened for you. Share with them the gospel hope that you have that they can have. You know the power of God in the new birth. You know it. You know the change. You know the transformation that comes by the Holy Spirit in conversion and then in progressive sanctification every day of your life. 
You are the living proof that God changes imprisoned sinners into beloved children of God through faith in the gospel. You know how new affections and new desires come into life, the, one, uh, the life of one who believes. You know that. And you know how an awareness of sin came when you believed. You know how love for Jesus and a, a desire for obedience to him comes on the outside of the prison door. You know that. You know how a willingness to be publicly associated with Jesus, no matter the cost, you know how that flows even from your heart now. Whatever the cost is, I want to be associated with Jesus, my Savior, my Lord. One who is still imprisoned in their sin and in God's wrath, but who is beginning to feel the conviction of sin from the Holy Spirit, that one needs to see gospel hope that exists on the outside of their prison and that it is a new life to live. Their lives will change. They won't come out and have fire insurance and still live like hell. They will come out a new creature in Christ, newness everywhere. Everything that their life will be on the outside will be absolutely the opposite of what it was inside and it will be counter to what they were inside. So walk into their imprisoned life humbly. Walk into their imprisoned life with compassion. Walk into their imprisoned life with truth. But walk into their imprisoned life with gospel hope. But there's hope for a new life. I mean, can you just remember yourself? Do you remember how miserable you were before you were saved? Do you remember how guilt-ridden you were before God saved you? Do you remember how you were trying everything to fix it and nothing was working? Do you remember? Do you remember? Give them hope. Everything will change. Everything will change. There's hope for a new life. There's hope for new desires. There's hope for a new power by which to live. There's hope for new loves that are pure. There's hope for new hates that are holy, the hatred of sin. Let them see all of that newness of life is focused directly on the glory of Jesus Christ, that that newness of life is to glorify him. It's given by him, and it's for him and his glory. If any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things pass away. Behold, new things have come. Let's pray. Father, we love these words of Paul. I have been crucified with Christ and it is no longer I who live. But outside the prison cell, Christ lives in me. That you would come and live inside men and women and boys and girls like us is shocking. Thank you. This life outside the prison cell is a life that we live in the flesh, but we live it by faith in the Son of God. And this life that is lived outside is stunned at the love at which you loved us that you gave your son up for us. Father, would you advance us in gospel humility and compassion? Would you give us boldness with gospel truth? And would you give us tenderness with gospel hope, even this week in our families, at our workplace, at school? And Father, I pray for those here this morning who need to be set free. Grant them faith and repentance, God, please. Give them clarity of mind. Renew their mind. They can't get there on their own. They need your grace. Let them see how deep your love is for sinners like us.